thank you all very much for coming and welcome to this uh, extra seminar with the Oxford Martin School. Um, I'm Tim Kruger from the Oxford Geoengineering Programme and uh, we just uh, earlier today we had a very interesting discussion about public participation in the dialogue about geoengineering. Um, but now we have a, a talk by Clive Hamilton uh, who is a Professor of uh, Ethics at the Centre for Applied Ethics by philosophy and public ethics, sorry, I should have had that ahead. Um, who's going to talk about rethinking the ethics of geoengineering. So, over to Clive. Thanks, Tim, very much. And uh, to the Oxford Martin School for inviting me to uh, give this talk. Um, okay, well, in this paper, I wanted to develop a uh, critique of a paper titled The Ethics of Ge Geoengineering, written by um, six uh, philosophers of the James Martin Geoengineering Working Group at this uh, university, uh, whom I'll refer to as Powell or Powell. Um, the, the paper in question is only a working draft, um, but it is out there in the public domain and therefore uh, is something that uh, has a public influence and therefore deserves uh, some scrutiny. The paper uh, provides a uh, justification, as I read it at least, for the deployment of geoengineering by suggesting that the moral arguments uh, against deployment are weak. Now, the arguments in the paper, which I want to deal with, are uh, specific to the paper, that are more broadly out there in the public domain, although often they, with very little uh, thought given so far to the ethics of uh, geoengineering, so it's good, uh, certainly for me, uh, to have papers like the one I'm critiquing because it's forced me to try to crystallise my own views and uh, present them today, I hope, uh, much more clearly. So I want to argue that the main claims made by Powell et al. Uh, are not consistent with the emerging uh, science of climate change and geoengineering and more broadly Earth system science. And I'll argue that a fuller understanding of climate science and the implications of geoengineering actually exposes the weaknesses uh, of the consequentialist philosophical approach uh, to geoengineering, which is the one that the authors are uh, going to it. Now, I'll assess the paper's arguments. The paper talks about geoengineering, um, but as you know, geoengineering covers a multitude of sins or possibly virtues. Um, but I want to assess it against one particular uh, geoengineering technology that is being proposed, and that is the program of spraying sulfate aerosols into the upper atmosphere in order to reflect back into space a great proportion of incoming solar radiation. Now, this form of solar radiation management, This uh, form of solar radiation uh, management is uh, designed to offset uh, global warming by mimicking the effect of a large volcanic eruption. Currently around 23% of uh, solar radiation is reflected back into space by Earth's atmosphere, and it's estimated that uh, the warming associated with a doubling of carbon dioxide emissions, uh, sorry, a doubling of CO2 concentrations, uh, could be offset if an additional 2% um, of uh, incoming solar radiation were reflected. Now, such a program of uh, what might be called global dimming would require a fleet of high-flying aircraft fitted with uh, special tanks and spraying devices to inject aerosols into the atmosphere, pretty much on a continuing basis. Uh, alternatively, a, uh, a long hose held aloft by balloons could perform the task. This is a company, Intellectual Ventures, which is developing the so-called Strapper Shield. This is a company back in part at least by Bill Gates. Now, of course, there are more benign geoengineering proposals in solar radiation management uh, through sulfate aerosol injections, including various forms of carbon dioxide removal. But, um, I believe, uh, aerosol spraying is currently regarded as the cheapest uh, most effective and most likely geoengineering technology to be deployed, especially in a so-called climate emergency. 
Now, in the uh, paper uh, uh, that I'm critiquing, uh, Powell et al. make six uh, main arguments, and in brief, they are as follows. Uh, first of all, on unintended uses, uh, they suggest that the risks of misuse of geoengineering technologies by terrorist or military forces, for example, can be min minimised through sound regulation. Secondly, uh, the possibility that the development of geoengineering techniques will reduce the incentive to cut carbon emissions need not be a concern, they argue. Reducing carbon abatement incentives might in fact be a good thing if there is a cheaper alternative. So, as they write, the moral hazard objection has force only if contributing to climate change is intrinsically wrong, a view they later reject. On risk aversion, um, it's argued that the precautionary principle does not offer useful ethical guidance for the design and implementation of geoengineering technologies because it's either vacuous and unhelpful in its weak form uh, or imposes what they call irrationally restrictive prescriptions due to excessive risk avoidance. The fourth argument uh, concerns the delicate state of nature. Popular worries about interfering in the climate system arising from the belief that the natural world exists in an optimal equilibrium state that's easily and dangerously disturbed are contradicted by evolutionary theory and ecological science. Next, the conceptual distinction between uh, natural and unnatural is, they say, notoriously problematic. The penchant <coughs> for distinguishing between human-induced harms and natural harms is not supported by any plausible moral principle but is an affect-driven or emotional response. And finally, on the question of justice, problems of justice associated with geoengineering, the argument is that concerns about the justice of geoengineering can be resolved by assessing the positive and negative effects and applying a, a theory of distributive justice. So the essential conclusion of the paper, and, and others who have put a similar position, <coughs> is that there's no prima facie justification for attempting to preserve the current climate if some other climate might be better for humans and animals. So that a deliberate move to a warmer climate through human intervention is ethically justified. This ethical conclusion is structured by the implicit question that uh, is uh, posed, that's brought to the geoengineering problem. Um, and that question is, what are the consequences for human well-being of undertaking geoengineering? So, according to this view, the ethics of geoengineering can be evaluated by identifying the risk-weighted uh, positive and negative impacts of warming and geoengineering, which, it's argued, um, are no different from other environmental interventions, such as GMOs and invasive species. And in short, there's nothing exceptional about global warming. I'll suggest that uh, the, under, the understanding of the Earth on which this approach is founded is inconsistent with um, developments in Earth system science. Um, and at the end, if I've got time, I'll uh, uh, go on from critique and try to prevent, present an alternative understanding of the Earth and the relationship of humans to it, one that implies a different uh, way of thinking about the ethics of geoengineering. So let me talk first about um, the conception of the Earth underlying the paper, or well, well, at least implicitly underlying the paper, and perhaps Julian, when he responds to the claim that I've misrepresented uh, the uh, view underlying the paper, we'll see. Well, the understanding uh, of the paper um, is that the Earth um, is a collection of discrete ecosystems and components that can be conceptually grasped. Uh, they're assumed that you assume discreteness and well-defined properties of ecosystems and components of the Earth system allow an easy recourse to technological intervention and manipulate, manipulation to generate some well-defined outcomes. It's a kind of cybernetic conception of the Earth as a set of well-defined and functional systems that are subject to control. 
And the examples given um, to sustain uh, this view relate uh, to, to, to make the case that nature is not in a state of delicate balance. Uh, the examples given relate to particular ecosystems and human interventions in them. But Earth system science, particularly in recent years, shows that this conception is misleading when trying to understand uh, climate change and planet-wide interventions such as solar radiation management. And I'll suggest that there are five reasons uh, to motivate a different conception of the Earth. The first, and I think this is a crucial point, which is hardly been made, if at all, and that is that solar radiation management through sulfate, sulfate aerosol injections envisages the manipulation of the flow of primary energy uh, to the planet as a whole, the energy that sustains all life and all ecosystems. The atmosphere acts as the mediator between sun and earth, transferring heat and mass to the biosphere, the hydrosphere, the cryosphere, that's the ice-bound parts, and the geosphere. By influencing the overall energy balance for the earth, solar radiation management will affect all ecosystems and their interactions. Uh, secondly, climate science has shown that the climate system is extremely complex and changes in it can't be isolated from changes in other elements of the Earth's system. So it's well understood, but doesn't seem to be uh, anywhere uh, uh, answered, uh, that sulphate aerosol injection, while probably uh, would be successful at suppressing warming, would do nothing to slow the acidification of the oceans. Indeed, if by relieving pressure to mitigate, to reduce emissions, global dimming net carbon emissions can uh, continue to grow more quickly, uh, then um, sulphate aerosol intervention would actually lead to faster acidification of the oceans. Acidification and the damage it does to corals and crustaceans shouldn't be regarded as a side effect of geoengineering of this type because the oceans are, and, and, and are, are as important to climate change as the atmosphere. You can't just separate the oceans as some subsidiary part of what's happening to the atmosphere as a result of human and his climate change. The third argument I'll put is this. As it uh, is not possible and won't be possible to carry out the test of the effects of sulfate aerosol spraying on the global climate system. I mean, you simply can't scale it up to a sufficient size to do a test of it. Any deployment uh, will be embarked upon under conditions of great uncertainty. The risks are multiplied by the fact that scientists will be unable to observe the effects of global dimming for at least 10 years into the program because many years of data will be needed in order to separate the effects of aerosol spraying from other influences on the climate system. If, after a decade of suppressed warming, this slide is just to sort of illustrate, this is a modelling study of the effects of uh, adding sulphate aerosols under a doubling of CO2 concentrations, and you can see that it does bring warming back uh, in the lower atmosphere to something close to the natural level, but in the upper atmosphere it actually seems to lead to a cooling. It's just to give you a sort of hint of the difficulty you need to have at least 10 years of data um, in the real world to be able to get proper measurements to see whether this kind of modeling projection is anything like uh, the reality once you uh, uh, spread sulfate aerosols through, through the atmosphere. But if after a decade of suppressed warming it's decided that solar intervention was a bad idea, it would in all likelihood uh, be impossible to stop uh, because of the danger of um, the so-called termination problem, that is the rapid rebound of global temperatures as a result of the uh, uh, quick removal of this sulfate pollution in the, in the upper atmosphere. So in light of these facts, any presumption that working out um, the economics or the ethics of geoengineering uh, is straightforward, I think is uh, uh, misplaced or at least very hopeful. And the untenability of the idea that we can, with any degree of confidence, 
isolate the effects of solar intervention to bring about a cooler climate is perhaps why supporters of geoengineering are increasingly framing it as an emergency response, that is, as an intervention too urgent to warrant careful analysis. I should say that Stephen Brainer earlier today challenged my reading of the situation that more and more uh, supporters of geoengineering, or, or at least of geoengineering research, are framing it as an emergency response, but certainly that's my reading of it. My fourth argument <clears throat> is that the Earth system that solar radiation management would seek to control is marked not only by complexity but by non-linearities. The tipping points that define rapid shifts from one climate state to quite a quite different one are not well understood, but two facts are known well enough. First, the dangers of tipping points um, are not theoretical but are of immediate concern. In fact, we may well have crossed one or two of them already, including um, the loss of uh, um, Arctic summer sea ice. Um, and we'll likely cross three or four more if the temperature reaches four degrees above pre-industrial levels, as is now expected before the end of the century. This analysis, and there are others very similar to it, show that if the world um, implemented the commitments that a range of countries had made that confirmed proposals, then we'd be heading for four degrees of warming towards the end of the century. So that's the sort of optimistic scenario. Four degrees. In addition to that, uh, tipping points uh, generate irreversible changes, not just to the climate, but to the biosphere. The idea uh, that there are smooth trade-offs between costs and benefits, implicit in the sort of utilitarian framework that's brought uh, to this problem, can't easily accommodate irreversible impacts. What is a lost species or a lost ecosystem worth? The rate of extinction today is 100 to 1,000 times faster than the natural level, due increasingly to human-induced climate change. Prima facie, this fact alone, I think, is a strong argument for preferring the natural state uh, or as close to it as we can feasibly preserve. Apart from the uncertainties, the unknowns, uh, the threshold effects arising from this complexity and the non-linearity of the Earth system, there's one dominant fact that I think overrides um, pretty much every other, and that is that carbon dioxide persists in the atmosphere for hundreds, indeed, uh, thousands of years. Uh, so it's possible, indeed likely, that before the larger impacts of warming are felt, humans will have committed future generations to an irreversibly hostile climate lasting a thousand years. Four degrees, of course, it's very unlikely to stop at four degrees. Once you get close to that, all sorts of things have been triggered and uh, you really got a system running out of control. In sum, because it involves a change to the Earth's entire climate system, the risk structure of climate change is radically different for those of other environmental problems leading various commentators to apply phrases like diabolical, a devil's stew, and nightmare scenarios. Um, the possibility of catastrophe, uh, including the destruction of civilization, has led uh, uh, Martin Weitzman, an economist with a superior grasp of climate science, which nevertheless hasn't caused him to abandon, abandon any of his economics, uh, but nevertheless, he's concluded that um, this factor, this extraordinary complexity and the long-lasting effects of CO2 emissions, uh, overwhelms uh, all others in trying to assess the threat of climate change. Let me now get, come to the question of uh, uh, why, uh, directly, why we should uh, prefer the natural. Well, the consequentialist position developed in the paper by Powell et al. Um, rejects the idea that the natural uh, exercise of any sort of ethical tool. They argue that it's incorrect to view the natural world as delicately <coughs> balanced and benevolently configured. And put forward various claims to the effect that natural systems are both naturally unstable, 
so that human induced changes are not exceptional, and that they are robust against human intervention. Since what humans do cannot disturb the delicate balance of nature, because there isn't one, the risks of intervention are lower than many people believe. In fact, I'd suggest Earth system science shows the opposite. There are three reasons for privileging the natural. Now, it's true that over geological timescales, the Earth's climate system has been highly variable. Yet the last 10,000 years, the epoch known as the Holocene, has been a period of unusual stability for the Earth's environment. You can see it on the right hand side that, around that pink area of uh, uh, global temperature. You can see that over the last 10,000 years, it's been, the Earth's temperature has been remarkably stable over a paleo climate timescale. This type of uh, benevolent constancy of the Holocene has permitted human civilization to flourish. As Homo sapiens spread across the planet, settlement was heavily influenced by the climates they found. It's not accidental that today uh, deserts and the Antarctic are not heavily populated, and that, uh, and that uh, most cities are located near rivers and oceans. The infrastructure for nearly 7 billion people to live as they do today has uh, taken um, uh, several hundred years to develop. That's only the last couple of hundred years for most of it, or if you want to go back and count agriculture as well, a couple of thousand. And, it's been, and this has been possible, this development, this stability, this growth in human population, the rise of civilization has been possible because of the relatively stable, stable and sympathetic climate that marks the Holocene. Nor is it true, however, that this stable and benevolent climate of the last 10,000 years is resilient against human interference. While the paper builds a case for geoengineering on claims that the natural world is robust uh, in the face of human interference, some geoscientists are now arguing that humans have so transformed the face of the Earth that we require a new geological epoch to succeed the whole thing. Beginning with the Industrial Revolution, the Anthropocene is defined by the fact that environmental change is driven mainly by humans rather than natural processes. And the most important features, coming out roughly, are the huge increase in human numbers, up from about 800 million in 1750, um, and the transformation of the atmosphere due to anthropogenic, anthropogenic greenhouse emissions over the last uh, 50 to 100 years in particular. Now the point is that while the Holocene was relatively stable, the Anthropocene is likely to be very unstable, depending on decisions made by humans. In a landmark intervention in 2009, 27 experts wrote uh, in Nature, actually a summary of a, a longer paper, a summary that appeared in Nature, uh, in the following terms. The Anthropocene, they wrote, could see human activities push the Earth system outside the stable environmental state of the Holocene, with consequences that are detrimental or even catastrophic for large parts of the world. Focusing on past resilience, they wrote, may lull us into a false sense of security because incremental change can lead to the unexpected, unexpected crossing of thresholds that drive the Earth's system or significant subsystems that drive the, those systems abruptly into states deleterious or even catastrophic to human well-being. Of course, the kinds of abrupt changes now I anticipate are those that are happening or will happen too quickly for humans and most other species uh, to adapt. The point about the latest phase of uh, uh, climate change that the Earth has experienced is happening extremely quickly in a way that's too fast for most species to adapt to. So Earth system science shows that um, uh, on consequentialist grounds alone, a strong case can be made that the natural state is to be preferred ethically. 
and that the suggestion that there is no prima facie justification for attempting to preserve the current climate and uh, that human, uh, humans would be ethically justified in attempting to move to a better climate are uh, risky and the dangerous positions to take. Now it might be argued that uh, geoengineering is designed to return the Earth to its pre-industrial climate, but I think I've said enough uh, so far to suggest that suppressing warming by solar radiation management will not return the Earth to its previous state, if only uh, focusing on the continued acidification of the oceans, like the mentioned the transformation of the biosphere itself. <coughs> Let me move now to uh, another major argument in the paper, and that is uh, the talk of winners and losers from climate change, where it's suggested by Powell et al. that, remember, there's no prima facie justification for attempting to preserve the current climate, and that uh, setting the global thermostat to a higher temperature, that I use that phraseology, but I am, setting the global thermostat to a higher temperature uh, can be justified. Yet as soon as we, uh, sorry, as soon as the, um, this consequentialist approach is put into practice, the particular world view on which it's based um, starts to show weaknesses. Consider the claim in the paper, which we often hear in the public debate, Casual debate, you know, over the bar or at the or kitchen table, newspapers or wherever. The uh, comment often made that global warming would be substantially beneficial. Um, in this case, in the paper, they say in Canada and Russia, global warming would be substantially beneficial for Canada and Russia. Now, there are at least three difficulties with picking out certain groups or nations as beneficiaries of climate change. First, the effects on people uh, of climate change will arise not so much from gradual warming, but from extreme events, both directly and from economic and political consequences. Uh, those who imagine themselves basking in more temperate climates are likely to be in for a rude shock. Russian enthusiasm for warming cooled in 2010 after the unprecedented summer heat wave, drought and devastating forest fires which killed some 50,000 people. It's also not possible to isolate Canada and Russia from the rest of the world. Of course, a financial collapse in the US or China triggered by one or a series of extreme weather events would cause global financial dislocation, uh, effects on trade, asset prices and so on, which would cascade through all markets. And of course, a water war between, say, Pakistan and uh, India would have worldwide fallout. Secondly, ethical consequentialism assumes that a method of aggregating the impact from all groups using some form of utilitarian calculus can be found and applied. In Canada, for example, Many Inuit people believe that changes in the Arctic region are already threatening their way of life. Like the homelands of Pacific Islanders threatening their inundation, um, or the sacred sites of indigenous people, the Inuit way of life cannot easily, I would argue uh, cannot consistently, be traded off against some bundle of goods and services. Yet this seems to be what uh, the paper assumes in claiming that warming would be beneficial for some countries. So the claim assumes the conclusion that the paper set out to reach, that the kind of analysis the paper justifies, a risk and distribution weighted summing of the consequences, has already been carried out, and that the interests of the Inuit, for example, have been accommodated ethically. The third argument against this way of approaching it, and I think perhaps the most significant argument, is that the scientific question is not whether an altered climate would be better or worse, but whether it would be safe or dangerous. The um, central objective of the Framework Convention on Climate Change is to achieve stabilisation of greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere at a level that would prevent dangerous anthropogenic interference with the climate system. And uh, the boundary between 
uh, what uh, between safe and dangerous levels of warming is believed uh, to be, in the words of uh, Rob Strong that I quoted earlier, what is required to avoid the crossing of critical thresholds that, se that separate qualitatively different climate system states. Qualitatively different climate system states. Now, specifying a safe level of global warming, as anyone who's followed the debate, is notoriously difficult. Uh, but one thing can be said that the more scientists try to define what is a safe level of warming, the lower the temperature gets. Um, so it's trending downwards the more uh, climate scientists look at. Um, but this fact, nevertheless, that we're looking for a safe level rather than some sort of optimal uh, level defined by uh, sort of utilitarian cost benefit analysis, that means that rather than approach it with a cost benefit sort of assessment of trying to find the optimal uh, global temperature, uh, this, um, these facts uh, and the UN Framework Convention's objectives suggest that what we should be pursuing is a safe minimum standard approach rather than some uh, optimal temperature. The lack of certainty out of what constitutes a safe uh, level of warming uh, in a non-linear world and the potentially very harmful or catastrophic consequences of exceeding that safe level provide grounds for a cautious, in fact an extremely cautious approach. The implicit assumption of high levels of certainty about the impact of a given level of warming that underpins a kind of cost-benefit analysis that some economists do, and I would suggest is sort of in the back of the minds of uh, Powell et al, has little basis in climate science, particularly at uh, above levels of warming of 2 degrees. So uh, a group of climate scientists, eminent scientists, uh, climate scientists, produced just before Copenhagen what they call the syn synthesis report, updated, they're basically drawn from the lead authors of the IPCC's fourth assessment report, and they put together a sort of update just before Copenhagen, and they concluded beyond two degrees centigrade, the possibility for adaptation of society and ecosystems rapidly uh, declined. Uh, with an increasing risk of social disruptions through health impacts, water shortages, and food insecurity. Uh, given that two degrees of warming now seems inevitable, inevitable uh, and that four degrees seems likely, even under reasonably optimistic assumptions about global response over the next two decades, this statement here, and many like it from climate scientists, contradicts the claim that global warming doesn't deserve any exceptionalist treatment. So the complex and volatile interactions of Earth systems and our still meagre understanding of their workings means that the idea that humans can choose an optimal global average temperature and set the thermostat at their level is a fallacy perhaps an extremely dangerous one. <coughs> An optimal degree of warming may prove to be only a temporary way station on a path to more warming. And it's well established that the amount of damage caused by warming is an increasing function of the degree of warming. The debate over how much warming is safe and the existence of thresholds beyond which warming is dangerous and possibly catastrophic contradicts the implicit assumption or implicit, arg implicit argument that an optimal level of intervention through solar radiation management can be calculated and set by some kind of cost benefit analysis. These, I think, are strong grounds for the inherent desirability of the Holocene climate and for adopting a cautious, a cautious approach. But maybe they can be accommodated by stretching the consequentialist frame without having to accept that the natural state is ethically preferable, except insofar as preserving the natural is most likely to maximise human welfare. An intrinsic preference for the natural state must be rooted in grounds other than instrumentalist calculation. Here it's uh, vital to understand, the, this is a sort of epistemological point, which I think is very important to make of the devil's public debate, and to tell the truth, only come clear to me in recent times. 
It's vital to understand the role of scientific arguments in establishing ethical positions, particularly in this global warming area. Those who argue for the delicate state of nature um, and demand that uh, we tread lightly on the earth draw on ecological science uh, not as a form of proof but as a means of evoking a certain attitude towards nature, one of respect, humility and reverence. Images of nature in the balance, uh, the majesty of whales, the blue planet um, are symbols that draw attention to the kind of relationship that humans have or should have towards the natural world. Now, how the individual arrives uh, at a position on the scale from extreme instrumentalism, justifying domination over nature, to extreme reverence, inviting great humility uh, in our uh, dealings with the natural world, a scale that otherwise might be represented um, uh, and personalise it by uh, Gary Becker, the Chicago economist who defined love as a non-marketed household commodity, <laughs> to Mahatma Gandhi, for example, on this side. How people end up on that spectrum is a complex question that I can't explore here. But um, I note that the uh, instrumentalist position is used, at least implicitly, to justify the right of humans to manipulate the climate in their interests. And I suggest that such a right exists only if the climate system and the Earth as a whole exists to serve the interests of humans. Now, let me comment on two other important arguments in the paper, and then I've got a couple of minutes I'll try to suggest an alternative uh, uh, view of the world and the relationship of humans to it. Let me deal with two arguments. The moral hazard argument in the paper and the justice argument, just uh, for a couple of minutes on each. The moral hazard argument is the claim uh, that, um, uh, well, the argument in the paper is that moral hazard need not be an ethical objection to geoengineering. The moral hazard argument, remember, is the argument that uh, if an alternative becomes available to reducing greenhouse gas emissions, and this will reduce people's incentives to engage in mitigation, production of um, uh, our carbon emissions. And uh, Powell et al. suggests that um, this isn't uh, necessarily a problem because the availability of a cheaper means of reducing warming through geoengineering, and in my case, solar radiation management, uh, might be a beneficial thing because it might provide a cheaper alternative to the high cost of cutting uh, carbon dioxide emissions. Now this argument, um, I, I, which is made uh, around, uh, around the debate, uh, uh, in my view mistakenly transposes an understanding of incentive to develop for private market behaviour into the realm of public policy decision making. And in the longer version of this paper, I argue why this is, uh, why this is a mistake. Nevertheless, uh, setting that aside for the moment, the moral hazard argument can be suitably modified and think about it in a political context rather than uh, as uh, governing our private market behaviour is a useful uh, device for drawing attention to the implications of geoengineering for the political incentives that come to bear on the climate change problem. The availability of a, of a policy substitute that can be made to appear attractive may make it easier for governments to act against the national interest. We know that those whose financial interests will be damaged by abatement policies, fossil fuel companies, have been using their power in a political system to slow or prevent action. So fossil fuel corporations have decided that it's more profitable to invest in lobbying governments to stop abatement laws than to invest in technologies to reduce their carbon exposure. It's a commercial decision. So the argument that we should not be too concerned about moral has breaks down when the powerful can use the availability of alternatives to emission cuts to undermine political and public determination to reduce emissions. <coughs> Already, in its very early days, but I think we'll see a lot more of this, 
representatives of the fossil fuel industry have begun to talk of geoengineering as a substitute for carbon abatement, a technology that will get them off the hook. Economic analysis, there have been a couple of economic analyses of geoengineering solutions, including solar radiation management, usually comes out as by far the cheapest way of dealing with the, uh, the problem. Economic analysis isn't interested in a kind of judicious technological mix or emergency backup uh, that uh, defended by some scientists, but will readily conclude, if the numbers show this, and they do, uh, that um, geoengineering should be pursued as the sole solution if the costs of geoengineering solutions prove to be cheaper than carbon abatement. And indeed, in the popular book, Super Free Economics, uh, the authors insist that the prospect of solar radiation management renders mitigation unnecessary. For anyone who loves cheap and simple solutions, things don't get much better. A Republican presidential candidate and former House Speaker Newt Gingrich has declared, geoengineering holds forth the promise of addressing global warming concerns for just a few billion dollars a year. Instead of penalising <coughs> ordinary Americans who would have an option to address global warming by rewarding the scientific invention to bring on the American ingenuity. So you can already see that the moral hazard argument is becoming a very significant one amongst those uh, probably heard as well, uh, those who um, are looking to avoid having to cut emissions. So in practice, moral hazard is perhaps the most powerful ethical argument against geoengineering. On the justice question, um, it's one of the central ethical issues the paper recognises uh, quite rightly. In practice, deciding on the justice of geoengineering interventions would be extremely difficult. Um, in particular, if a country, unilaterally, or a few countries, uh, decide to employ, deploy solar radiation management, then of course that would violate uh, any uh, notions of procedural justice. Um, but aerosol spraying, as I've mentioned, is increasingly advocated as a response to a climate emergency, uh, that is, uh, to be deployed rapidly because of a sudden and dire shift in global weather patterns over the next two or three decades. Now, an emergency response usually means taking decisive action without waiting for consultation and deliberation. The suspicion that fair procedures will be ignored will persist as long as people who are talking about emergency response, fail to define what the criteria are for an emergency and which body, national or international, would declare that a sufficiently serious climate emergency has arrived to justify uh, a program of sulphate aerosol spraying or other geoengineering interventions. Now, at every stage of global negotiations, um, they have been riven with fundamental disagreements over, how, uh, over what is a fair um, response to climate change, over how to allocate the burden, over who is responsible, over who should, who should pay for it, and so on. Um, as you know, the principle of justice embodied in the Framework Convention is that nations should uh, contribute to the solution according to their common but differentiated responsibility. But this idea has been interpreted in radically opposed ways. Um, and yet, when you look at uh, the impacts of um, uh, solar radiation um, management, uh, sulfate aerosol spraying, early modelling studies suggest that it could be that the Indian monsoon could be disrupted, which would jeopardise food supply for 100 million people or several hundred million people. But we have no data to assess that uh, properly. So, if solar radiation management methods were employed, disentangling the effects of SRM uh, from uh, other effects of warming or other uh, uh, non anthropogenic changes in the climate would be extremely difficult. It would take a long time. You can guarantee that there would be no resolution of what a just solution uh, is, and we're much more likely to see some sort of force majeure uh, imposed by a dominant power. So, in the light of these unknowns and uncertainties, the suggestion uh, that problems of justice in geoengineering can be resolved and therefore aren't going to be an obstacle or need not be an obstacle to geoengineering 
are, I think, the best uh, premature. Well, let me just spend five minutes finishing off, uh, if I can, talking about a different conception, because this might actually get to the heart of uh, the disagreement that perhaps uh, Julian might like to, to respond to. Uh, now, I'm putting forward a different ethical position which I maintain is consistent with uh, the developments in earth system science that have emerged over the last 10 or 20 years. We just go back a bit historically and I suggest that flowing from the scientific revolution and the and enlightenment philosophy, um, a new conception of the world and human beings emerged. And that is of human beings as a, as a uh, the human being became a distinct subjective entity that's separated from the world around it and on which, guided by its cognitive abilities, uh, this being acts in order to pursue its own interests. And the transition from an organic conception of nature to a mechanical one, which came about in the 17th and 18th centuries, is of course a, uh, a history that's been well told uh, by, for example, Carol Merchant in her book, uh, The Death of Nature. And philosophically, we saw paralleling the scientific revolution, uh, the emerging uh, positions of Descartes, uh, followed up by Kant, uh, where uh, the idea of the autonomous human subject uh, uh, posed to the objective external world, uh, imagined as a representation, became the dominant mode of philosophically representing the world and the place of human beings in it. And it's a model in which rational and willing subjects, discrete egos existing inside bodies, exercise control over an inert environment. So the modern subject appears in various guises today, not least as homologous and as, uh, well that's a term that's now out of fashion, animal rationalis. Now, the type of um, uh, calculated thinking that resorts to the framework of uh, cost-benefit analysis, scientific management and industrial processes, risk assessment and so on, I call technological thinking. Technological thinking understands the world as a collection of more or less useful resources. According to this view, technology transforms potentially useful things into useful things without stopping to ask about the origins of the world as a collection of potentially useful things. So modern technology challenges nature to supply materials and energy for extraction and storage, to open itself up as possibilities for human progress, providing a path for the fulfilment of human existence. And as such, modern technology reveals something essential about the nature of modern humans, that is our determination to shape the world around us, to suit our desires, desires which have no limit. Plans to engineer the Earth through the deployment of contrivances to manipulate the atmosphere represent, I'd suggest, the culmination of three and a half centuries of objectification of the natural world. So the Earth as a, as a whole is now represented at, at in geoengineering as an object open to regulation through plans to manage the amount of solar radiation reaching the Earth or to adjust the amount of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere to a level calculated to be optimal. Geoengineering represents a conscious attempt to overcome all resistance uh, of the natural world to human domination, a last great stride towards total mastery. Yet, as I've suggested, the sheer complexity and unpredictability of the natural world resists attempts at total, at total mastery. And I suggest, just to uh, reinforce the point, that there are three scientific developments that reinforce uh, this view. First, I've talked about the Anthropocene, uh, the idea that humans have altered the planet to such an extent that it's now dominated uh, by human uh, activity. As uh, one uh, Earth System scientist uh, wrote, actually a group of them, no, sorry, one. By the latter half of the 20th century, the terrestrial biosphere made the transition from being shaped primarily by natural biophysical processes to an anthropogenic 
biosphere in the Anthropocene shaped primarily by human systems. But it's becoming apparent, I think, also from both system science and climate science, that, that under the Anthropocene, the Earth is not mere putty uh, to be shaped at will by humans. Uh, as I've suggested, the existence of thresholds, tipping points, unknowns, intricate interactions suggest that the Earth doesn't behave according to the systematic, predictable frame that's been projected onto it since the time of the scientific revolution. Um, and I just want to make the point that it's not just the biosphere, the hydrosphere, the cryosphere that are affected by uh, anthropogenic warming and indeed would be affected by uh, geoengineering interventions, particularly in the shape of some of that aerosol injections. Um, the, um, the whole globe itself and its place in space is actually in play because global warming is expected to alter slightly, very slightly, but nevertheless, uh, the Earth's rotation speed and its orientation in the solar system. And this is because the melting of the ice um, masses around the world will redistribute uh, the mass of the Earth, uh, will also uh, uh, change uh, seismic and volcanic activity, and uh, so what we're seeing is that it's not, you know, it's actually the geological processes themselves and the orientation of the Earth in the universe, the solar system at least, are actually in play. I mean, the point I'm trying to make is that everything is in play, it's not just the atmosphere. Um, The second and third points I've made here, I, I, I don't have time to develop them, but simply that, that really what we, I think that geoengineering, particularly solar radiation management, represents some huge leap. To, to this point, humans have intervened, intervened with their technology to transform particular uh, parts of the, of the planet. We've had a huge impact, but it's not been part of our conscious attempt to, uh, to manipulate the planet as a whole. What's been proposed now in the, in the form of sulfate aerosol injections is to actually take control of the climate system of the Earth entirely. To actually subject it to human management through changing the chemical composition of the atmosphere. And, and I think this is a really profound leap uh, in, what, uh, in, in, in our thinking. And it disturbs me greatly that we seem to have made this smooth and easy transition from the idea of deploying all these technologies that we've developed over the last hundred of years to shifting, well, we've got this problem of global warming, that's fine, we will seize control of the Earth's atmosphere. We will change its chemical composition to affect the amount of solar radiation reaching it, effectively forever. Because the truth is, once we start it, it's going to be, for a number of reasons, exceptionally hard to stop. And my final point is this. I'm sorry I've spoken more than I should. Some climate scientists in this point about the uniqueness of human consciousness. But I think this speaks to a lot of people when they think about this huge dilemma that we're in. Some climate scientists have argued that, that catastrophic climate change now has to be considered. And it's not out of the question when you consider some of the uh, more extreme but quite feasible scenarios that humans may not survive. Against that, if you look in the field of cosmology, scientists appear to be converging on the conclusion, at least some very influential cosmologists are converging on the conclusion, that whilst there are probably many forms of primitive life, um, bacteria and so on in uh, other parts of the universe, it seems likely that the sole form of intelligent life in, in the cosmos is here on planet Earth. It seems likely that we humans are the unique repository of consciousness, the only being with the capacity to reflect on the cosmos. Now, if we put these two together, if humans were to disappear through our own actions, or indeed through an asteroid strike, then the universe would lose the only form of life capable of reflecting on it. And we have to, have to ask that question, would this matter? Now, a lot of people say, no, nah. you know, love locks it, so what? Or just a species that sprang up for a few thousand years, crawled over the earth, got wiped out, so what? Um, 
I think other people would, and I'd certainly take this view, that the existence of consciousness in the universe is in fact the most profound of all possible events. Uh, and its loss would have supreme ontological significance. Um, in that view, a universe without the capacity to reflect on itself would be a universe that would lose all meaning completely. So the stakes are high. Uh, Geoengineering uh, forces us, I think, to start to reflect on these huge issues about who we are, why we're here, what is the Earth, do we conceptualise it and think about it in the right way? What are the dangers of imagining that we can intervene uh, and with our grand technologies to take control of the Earth system as a whole? And is the Earth system going to allow us to do that? So I'll leave it there and look forward to your comments.